It's been another year, and despite the fact that I've long understood that time feels like it moves faster as you get older, I'm still at a loss as to where 2023 went. A lot happened throughout the year. I made a handful of videos I'm really proud of, I started a second channel that I've actually managed to be kind of consistent with, I watched my baby grow into a toddler, which is something I am still trying to grapple with, and I played a ton of video games. While the way I engage with games year to year, and honestly even game to game is ever changing, I do always find myself benefiting from them in one way or another, and as it has become a tradition for me at this point, I want to talk about the ones that helped me get through this year. These aren't necessarily my favorite games I played in 2023, but they are the ones that have made my life better in some way. So as always, the best place to start is at the start, with the first game I played last year, Bioshock Infinite. <laughs> I'm really not sure why I wanted to replay Infinite. I probably needed B-roll for a video, but regardless of the why, I chose to. And that choice has led to it being the single game I spent the most time thinking about in 2023. I've touched on it in other videos already, but Infinite used to be my favorite game ever, and replaying it confirmed that it very much no longer is. To be honest, there's not much I even like about it anymore, but at the very least, it still has the ability to grab hold of my brain and make me want to analyze every bit of it. And as as a person who has found a way to turn over analyzing things into a job, there is a lot of value to that for me. It's just a bit sad that it came at the cost of tarnishing what used to be a game I really cherished. There is a silver lining here though. Upon finishing Infinite, I decided to also revisit Bioshock 1 and 2, and I had a blast with both of them. Rapture is such an iconic and enjoyable place to explore, and the core mechanics of both, but especially Bioshock 2, are just a lot of fun to mess around with. However, what truly made it all work it was that I finally got around to playing Minerva's Den, and it is now by far my favorite entry in the franchise. It melds the best aspects of Bioshock 1 and 2 to make something really special, and I hope this is the blueprint the next Bioshock game works off of. Coming back to the series so many years later has been a bit weird because my ranking of the games now is pretty much the exact opposite of what it was a decade ago. With that said, I think starting the year with such a dramatic shift in opinion benefited me in a handful of ways. It was a reminder that my taste is ever changing, and while it's sad to go back to a game I used to love and walk away wondering how I ever loved it, it's exciting to know that a game that once didn't leave much of an impression has the potential to resonate so strongly with me now. I like knowing that I'm still capable of change, and I think a lot of joy can be found in challenging opinions that once felt like they were etched in stone. Obviously, there are too many things to play both new and old to justify revisiting everything in the way I did with the Bioshock series, but it is something I think is worth making time for as I enjoy finding finding the ways in which I look at things differently. Life is about constantly growing and figuring out who you are. And not long after finishing all the Bioshock games, I actually played a trio of titles all within the month of February that explored just that, and unsurprisingly, they ended up being three of my favorite games I played last year, those being Citizen Sleeper, Kana Bridge of Spirits, and Sable. All three, in some form, are about characters searching for their place in the world, and their relationship to their respective worlds is a pivotal one. Kana communes with spirits and rot to clear the corruption that has taken root within a mountain village and its surrounding areas. The Sleeper connects with both the people of the derelict space station they are stranded on, as well as the station itself in order to survive. And Sable treks across the dunes of her sandy planet to figure out what parts of it she is most drawn to. Obviously, plenty of games put a lot of importance on the world they take place within, but something about these three really vibed with me. The settings of Sable and Citizen Sleeper are both desolate locations that seem unsurvivable, and neither were really meant to be permanent spots to settle, but with nowhere else to go, the people found a way to make it home. In Kana, life has largely left the village and the surrounding regions, and it's on her to guide those who have been lost in order to restore peace in the forest. They are all places that so easily could be given up on, Yet, whether it's through the actions of the character you play as or those who came long before, life in these desperate locations finds a way. Ultimately, these are games about finding the good within places that on the surface seem devoid of it. And as someone who lives in a state that is frozen for four months out of the year, it shouldn't be a huge surprise that I connected to these worlds. Home is a weird thing that can be hard to truly find, but when you do, you end up seeing the place you live in a way that no one outside of it can really understand. 
moment. You truly get why it's special and also why it sucks, and there is a sort of pride in having that knowledge. No one will ever hate it and love it as much as you do, and playing in these worlds that, despite being nothing like my home, still reminded me of it, made me care about them in a way that most titles don't. They didn't make me feel better about how I had to shovel snow in the freezing cold every other day during that time of year, but they did reinforce why I'll never leave. While the games I played right after these three weren't as meaningful to me, they still were a ton of fun. Pizza Tower felt pretty close to a perfect game, absolutely nailing what fast platforming should feel like. The Resident Evil 4 remake took a game I didn't think needed to be remade and proved to me that I was wrong as hell. And the case of the Golden Idol made my brain buzz with excitement for solving little mysteries in a way that really only Outer Wilds and The Return of the Oberdin have been able to do. I got through as many games as I could during this stretch of the year as I knew one title was about to take over my entire schedule, which it very much did. And that, of course, was The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. Tears of the Kingdom is how I spent the month of May and honestly most of June. For that span of time, it was the only game I thought about. Hours would pass in the blink of an eye as I made my way across this familiar yet fresh version of Hyrule, and I found myself endlessly enthralled with the scope and versatility of Link's core abilities. I can't think of many games that I've had more fun with than this one, and while I certainly had a lot of issues with it that I plan to talk about more in a future video, the stuff I loved about it outweighed any problems I had by so much that it never got in the way of my enjoyment. Once I stopped playing it though, I barely thought about it anymore. Despite putting in a hundred hours and having a blast the whole time, it didn't leave much of a lasting impact on me. It was fun and had a lot of cool ideas, but it didn't feel revolutionary. It didn't change the way I look at games like Breath of the Wild did. And obviously, that's an unfair expectation to have. Nintendo's goal was to iterate on what Breath of the Wild established, not to redefine the series series again. Regardless, while this led to a very enjoyable title that I think is better than Breath of the Wild, it doesn't matter to me nearly as much. Had I played Tears of the Kingdom first, I imagine I'd feel very different, but there's no way to really know for sure. And it's an odd spot to be in, because while I did love my time with it, a part of me obviously wishes it had meant more to me. I wanted it to be my new favorite game of all time, but it's just not. I don't even know if it's in my top 20. This sort of thing is just part of life. You can't always predict what is going to matter to you, and if you expect every game you're looking forward to playing to redefine the medium or teach you some important life lesson, you're setting yourself up for disappointments. And I definitely did here. Sometimes a game is just a good way to spend a few weeks, and maybe one day my thoughts on it will shift, but for now at least, that's all Tears of the Kingdom was for me. After wrapping it up, I moved on to some more really solid games. Prodigal scratched the itch that's come from a lack of any new 2D Zelda titles, while also having its own spin on things that made it feel wholly unique. Remnant 2 got me playing games with friends for the first time in a while, and aside from the game itself just being a lot of fun, it was incredible to spend a ton of time hanging out with friends in voice calls who I normally only communicate with through text. And then I finally played Metroid Prime for the first time, as the remaster seemed like the perfect opportunity to jump into the series. And the most most notable thing about my experience with it is that it's what I was playing when I found out my wife and I would be having a second kid. Now, by no means did I find myself reflecting on the themes of the game and how they tied to parenthood, although I'm sure there's probably something there if you look hard enough. But playing it did ease my mind as the excitement of another kid on the horizon shifted to panic about the logistics of having a newborn. As I talked about last year, those first few months of having a very little baby are exhausting and overwhelming and generally terrifying. Dealing with that is hard enough, but this time around we'll also have a toddler to be trying to keep up with as well, and me being the anxious guy I am, when I first found out, my mind was running a mile a minute trying to solve how we would be able to do it all, and exploring the mysteries of Zebes broke up a bit of that worrying. Having something as engrossing as Metroid Prime to put some of my focus into made it harder for me to spiral in the way I want to do. Obviously, I still spent plenty of time thinking about everything to come, as one should, but having a way to help pace out both the excitement and fear saved me 
a lot of trouble. As the year continued, I hit a nice streak of games that were a ton of fun and also dampened some of the outside noise that I easily could have spent all my time hyper fixating on. The first was Slay the Spire, a game I've been meaning to play for years that I am now glad to report is in fact as good as everyone says it is, and I don't even like roguelites. Then I rolled into Lies of P and it exceeded all of my expectations, providing a challenging and rewarding Souls-like that is from soft levels of good. Throughout both of those playthroughs, I also kept going back to getting over it with Bennett Foddy, which now that I've beaten it a few times and can get over it pretty quickly, I find to be a strangely relaxing experience, and it was nice to boot it up when I only had 20 minutes or so to play something. And then, after all that, I moved on to the best game I played last year. Rain World. For the longest time, I was worried I wouldn't like Rain World. It came highly recommended to me by people whose opinions I trust, and pretty much in every video where I talked about the types of games I liked the most, those being atmospheric titles centered around player discovery, I'd get a handful of comments saying that I needed to play Rain World. I knew it was a game I could really love, but given its reputation as an unforgiving and brutal experience, I didn't want to jump in with the wrong mindset and potentially end up hating it. Rain World is difficult in a way that can be hard to swallow. You're given little direction but tons of freedom, and this makes it possible to go down paths that don't lead to any real progress. In fact, you can head in directions that make it extremely difficult to get back to where you started, and while you can't really get stuck, it's easy to feel like you are. Stack that with a simulated world that truly does not care about you, unpredictable enemy placements, and a set amount of time to get from one place to the next before the rain comes and absolutely obliterates you, and it leads to a game that can feel unfair at times. Honestly, it's not just that it feels unfair, oftentimes it is unfair. It's not a huge surprise that a ton of people who started end up bouncing off it very quickly, and I didn't want that to happen to me. So I dragged my feet for over two years, waiting for a time when I'd feel ready to play it. And when that time never came, because of course it didn't, I eventually decided that it'd be better to try it and hate it than to have it sit in my backlog for the rest of my life. And choosing to play it was one of the best decisions I made all year. Something about Rain World's design just gets me. Yes, it is unrelenting and cryptic and frequently cruel, but finding a way to overcome these things against all odds is thrilling and immensely satisfying. There aren't really notable upgrades, so getting better involves actually learning how the world, the creatures within it, and your little slug cat works, and figuring enough of these things out in order to reach the end feels incredible. The ending sequence was one of my favorite gaming experiences experiences of the year and honestly is up there for favorites of all time. Games built around the struggle are a hard sell, but there is a reason people love them so much. They get you to care deeply because of how much time, energy, and patience you invest in them. I understand why this kind of commitment isn't appealing to everyone. After a hard day, most people just want to play something that's fun and not something where they get eaten by a lizard within 5 seconds of turning it on. But man, do I love games that get me to care in this way. I think part of why it hit so hard for me is that it reassured me that I am capable of finding joy in the struggle. This is something I've learned many times throughout my life in many different ways, but it's something that can be easy to forget when in times of comfort, and that makes it scary to jump back into the struggle. Sometimes it takes doing something challenging, like playing a game like Rain World, to get some of that confidence back, to make it clear to myself that whatever the next challenge is, whether it's as inconsequential as a new game or as important as a newborn, I'll be able to handle it, and likely will get something out of it that I never could have expected. Even though I didn't think there would ever be a right time to start Rain World, it is clear to me now that I picked the perfect time for it, and it's something I think will stick with me forever. After this, you'd think I would take at least a bit of a break from games with a reputation for being tough, but instead I ended up replaying Demon Souls, Dark Souls, and Elden Ring as I needed footage for a video I was working on. Of course, as I've already played them all before, none of them felt terribly challenging to get through, although I did finally go back and beat Melania without using any Spirit Ashes, which took me 9 hours. Replaying these three titles back to back to back was interesting for a lot of reasons. On a personal level, it brought up a bunch of memories from when I first played these 
these games, and that felt especially true for Demon Souls. I'll never forget how hopeless I felt when first playing, as I hadn't experienced anything as obtuse and unforgiving as it before. It was the first time I played a game that I wasn't positive I'd be able to beat, and something about that appealed to me enough to want to keep working through it. It's funny going back now though, because it is by far the easiest FromSoft game I've played. It does have a decent amount of bullshit that can get you killed in unfair ways, but by and large, there's nothing that wildly difficult to overcome. After years and years of FromSoft continually escalating the difficulty and complexity of their bosses, the ones in Demon's Souls feel pedestrian by comparison. FromSoft has essentially been training its players to be better and better at these games with every release, and this has made me so much better at these types of games and honestly just video games in general. Playing through Demon's Souls, Dark Souls, and Elden Ring within the same month gave me a clear understanding of how far the studio has come while still holding on to a few central ideas that make FromSoft games feel like FromSoft games. It's hard to believe that over the course of just 15 years, a small, weird RPG would one day lead to one of the most ambitious games ever made, turning FromSoft into an absolute powerhouse in the industry. It's also hard to believe how different I am from the person I was when I first played that small, weird RPG. We often treat our adolescence as our most formative years, but the amount of change I have undergone between the releases of Demon's Souls and Elden Ring, all of which has been in my adulthood, has been immense. At this point of life, I've been playing video games as an adult for about as many years as I played them as a kid, and while Nintendo defined those early days, FromSoft has defined the later ones. Much of my tastes have been influenced by their work, and I've played their games along some of the biggest moments of my life. Life, from graduating college, to working my first real job, to getting married, to having a kid. I feel tied to FromSoft in a way, and it was nice to look back at how far both of us have come, and how their games have been there for me well beyond this past year. To end off 2023, I turned my focus mostly towards games with good vibes. Sea of Stars provided a colorful and interesting world with a really cool combat system, Cocoon broke my brain half a dozen times with its thoughtful and mind-boggling puzzles, Jassant made climbing in a video game both fun and meditative, and Highland Song gave me a beautiful and dense space to explore that has me considering buying a plane ticket to Scotland. All of these games offered a lot of space for reflection, which frankly was the dominating trend with most most of the games that got me through the year, and I'm glad it was. They helped me recognize a lot of change within myself. Like how my tastes have changed, how my understanding of the world around me has changed, how my expectations have changed, how my priorities have changed, and how the way I cope with things has changed. And through reflecting on my experiences with games and just other parts of life in general, I realized something not too long ago that I wish I had noticed sooner, which is that for the first time in a long time, I don't feel like I am just surviving. For so many years, my primary goal has just been to keep my head above water, to just hang on, to take things day by day. And this has looked a little different every year. To just focus on the past few, in 2020 it was dealing with social isolation, in 2021 it was feeling like this job was not sustainable, and in 2022 it was adjusting to the biggest life change I've ever had. I felt like there would always be something new and that I'd never be able to get my foot in, but then I did. And now I don't lie awake in bed every night. My jaw isn't clenched by default. I've stopped assuming the ground is going to fall out from under me. I'm not just hanging on. That isn't to say I'm thriving by any means. I still have a long way to go, and there are plenty of days where I struggle with feeling lonely or figuring out how to balance work and life or keeping up with my toddler, but it's been different lately. Overwhelm is no longer how I expect to feel when I wake up, and that shift has been a welcome one. There are still many things I am anxious about, both personally and globally, but I don't feel as if I'm always approaching those anxieties from my back foot. Of course, this sort of progress isn't a straight line. When the new baby comes, I will be right back in survival mode, taking things hour by hour just trying to get through the day. On top of that, life is unpredictable, and things will come up that push me back to that place. But just knowing that I can feel the way I feel right now makes me hopeful I'll be able to feel it again. As I've said already, games certainly provided me plenty of relief throughout the year, but instead of needing to lean on them to help carry me through it like I've done in the past, this year they mostly got me to realize that I've been carrying myself for a good while now. 
I don't know how this next year will go, but I am prepared for things to change, and I know I'm more capable of handling it than ever before. So here's to hoping this next year is better than the last, and that Silk Song actually comes out for real this time. One thing I've been trying to do this year to get back to just enjoying my time with games is to sometimes play them without recording or thinking about how I could turn it into a video, you know, like a normal person. So my wife and I decided to reset our Animal Crossing island to get a fresh start, meaning I've been playing the Switch more often, which in turn has made me want to play it more while on the go. With that said, I've never really had a great way to transport it aside from throwing it in the bottom of a backpack, and now it sounds like this when I turn it on. Oh no. But thanks to this video sponsor, Bellroy, and their handy tech kit, I now have the perfect way to take it from place to place. Bellroy has a wide range of products that are all focused on keeping you organized and making you look stylish. From phone cases that can store your cards to water resistant backpacks with all sorts of useful pockets, Bellroy provides functional yet sleek ways to carry your stuff. Additionally, they do a lot to minimize their environmental impact by using sustainable materials like ecotan leather and recycled nylon. Honestly, every time I go to the store, page, I want to buy everything. So if you're like me and want to get some sustainably produced high quality bags and accessories, click the link in the description to get 10% off anything at bellroy.com. Whether it's the tech kit or a wallet or a backpack, I imagine it will make your life better in one way or another. Anyway, thanks to Bellroy for sponsoring this video. For all of you still here, what's up? I'd like to thank my patrons for making this channel possible and give a special shout out to Victor Duva for being an honorary Bag Butin. That's all I've got. Hope you have a great day and or night, and I'll see you in the next one.